And many thanks, Liz, um, and thanks for your uh, invitation. I will try to share my screen. Hope that technology works. Um, and if you can let me know uh, if you can see my screen. Yep, I can see your screen. It's just not yet in the in the presentation. Yes. Let's try that. Is it a bit perfect? Yep. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, very interesting presentations and uh, indeed lots of interesting discussions, both in chat and in the presentation. Uh, on this one, I'm trying to discuss the understanding of the community, community level influences of COVID-19 incidents in England. And uh, this is actually an, um, an attempt which is done by my colleagues and myself. My role here was like put together the framework and discuss the technical stuff and lead the team. However, lots of the actual technical modeling and coding has been done um, with my team whose names are uh, actually highlighted here. Um, so a bit of background on this. Uh, it, this is part of the data science campus uh, at ONS supporting response to COVID-19 um, and our supports include developing a dashboard um, for UKHSA at the time called JBC and others uh, over the pandemic and supporting them with their sort of analysis, etc. But this specific project was looking into uh, whether we can bring together the high level admin level data from different sources and augment them to make an understanding of influences on risk at the community level. We have had many different models um, in, uh, at the uh, epidemiological models, which are focusing on the individual level very rightly and the sort of like influences within the household, such as household transition models, et cetera. However, this work is trying to understand the spatial interrelations and interactions at community level, when the people live together at the LSOA level, the lower uh, level output area. Um, and this actually can help tailoring research questions for detailed individual level and epidemiological analysis. So if you understand that, for instance, at the community level, certain communities are more at risk, then you would be able to focus on them in more detailed analysis that through the COVID infection survey that ONS is doing or other means can be done at individual level to tailor your research questions. So that's actually one of the benefits of understanding the community level. The other benefits include that things such as the biases that we all aware uh, within the data, such as test and trace data or vaccination. However, when you look at the spatial distribution rather than the individual detail, some of those biases can be less profound uh, compared to the individual level. Because I mean, even though you might look at the um, symptomatic, for instance, uh, groups of the people who come up positive, and uh, not all the asymptomatic, you still can make some assumptions that the spatial distribution, the geographical distribution of those are similar. Um, this work also aims to focus on the workplace risk, specifically after controlling for residential characteristics where the people who work in certain industries leave, um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, travel pattern, vaccination rates, etc. Um, and we try to understand what is the associated risk of working, for instance, I mean, why, the reason why we are doing that is trying to decoupling the influences which are highly interrelated otherwise. So, for instance, the people who are working in the warehousing tend to live in the most dense urbanized areas. So trying to understand that whether the associated potential risk with them is coming from where they live, or the type of workplace require doing a like with like comparison and analysis. So that's actually part of the attempt here to control things such as self selection and spatial sorting as well. That a sort of group of certain ethnicity might tend to prefer living with each other or due to the spatial inequality. Um, the work was also aimed to look in to be used as an early warning system. So. Uh, we were hoping to get this work and uh, the model to run on cloud as we did uh, we, we did it on the G G google cloud, cloud platform uh, so that as we receive a new data we can make a short-term prediction and as we see the data comparing with the data try to understand the uh, the biases and uh, the 
uh, sort of the differences between the observed data and the seen data to see if there are some areas which is very much outline of what we predicted, whether those can be considered as a, a potential new things happening, such as new variant or something which we cannot measure or we are not taking into account. So that is actually a new framework for augmenting data from different sources and also the individual and the community level information together. So that was also an attempt um, for, for, for simulating such a things. The stakeholders include the JBC, UKHSA and ONS, Happy Team, Health and Pandemic Team. HSE, uh, which is Health and uh, Security Executive, is not taking this work further within the part of the PROTECT COVID-19 National Core Study on Transmission Environment, and they are trying to introduce new uh, workplaces into this framework and expand it, basically, to have the workplace um, characteristics in as well, uh, so that they can look into the workplace risks. So the Method of analysis, first of all, uh, we bring together various different sources of information. We use the National Traverse Survey data, which is the individual level of data of the transport patterns, and apply a clustering, latent clustering approach to cluster the country into distinct travel patterns that I would explain in my next slide. We also look into the census 2011 data. As we discussed, it's old, but pretty good in steel capturing the population hierarchy and then the, also the population of like where people live and the profile uh, as those tend to be most stable over decades so central london suddenly doesn't become like a rural area if you like that way and the type of people etc living there it takes years although the transition happened but it takes long term so it can be a, a good source of data still however we use the media population estimate where those can be replaced um, for the 2009 media population estimate. We also use the IDBR data, which is actually capturing individual level workers by industry type at the workplace zone. And then we applied the census journey to work information to convert them to the home place area at LSOA level. So we had the workplace zone, we have the pattern of where they tend to work, to tend to live, given that they are working in certain zones, and we try to estimate probabilistically um, where they, uh, which ought LSOA they can be assigned to as their home place. And uh, we also had some dynamic data, such as Deimos footfall data set, which is the uh, telephonic data basically, um, uh, the telecoms data um, of the number of workers and visitors footfall, and we convert them to our time tranche to explain what they are, I mean, the periods of the time that we did the model for, and we also look into the national immunology management uh, services for the vaccination uptake and the test and trace data for as our dependent variable for the number of people. All these data aggregated at LSOA level and converted to the profiles, sort of proportion of the people vaccinated and normalized by the area at each LSOA. That's that's the type of things that we try to get here. Um, so that's the, our modeling framework. So on the left-hand side, you would see the clustering approach is a latent cluster analysis. So we use various different indicators such as accessibility to public transport, Board, population density, area type, bus frequency, walk down to bus stop, etc., as the indicators and conditional social economic characteristics. This method is actually developed prior to this work by myself, and then this actually the source explains here, and the colleague in Cambridge um, explains actually that, that that's the source of the paper here. But we segment the country into distinct travel patterns. Um, which are very much aligned with the area types, but a little bit different. I would explain it in the next uh, slide. And then within each of these clusters, then we look at the multivariate regression analysis. So we look at the central inner London as one cluster, and we did our modeling for them as a separate model to outer London and uh, metropolitan areas, et cetera, to rural area, to medium urban and small urban area. So we had the full interactions of the, um, the area types or the travel patterns uh, incorporated in this, into this. So we run this multivariate regression for each of them, which is the bunch of the static variables, as I explained, socioeconomic, demographic, workplaces, workers at risk industries, etc., 
and the dynamic features such as the mobility, which is tend to change over the time and the vaccination rate. I assume that that's the first time that, I mean, something like the telephonical data and mobile phone data is used in this manner so that we can actually control for the behavior or responses uh, as well. Um, so the analysis time trenches are explained here. We split also the data into different time periods, mainly based on the MPIs and then also the variant of the virus in circulation. So we started, I mean, starting from the um, May, May, uh, sorry, starting from the yeah, May 2020 uh, to August, going. Uh, to the December 2021, we split into like low prevalence when the schools were closed and Alpha and Delta variants are not yet emerged, then high prevalence as schools open, but negligible Alpha variant, then the Alpha variant become dominant, etc. These are actually borrowed from the Thomas House household uh, transition model, uh, which he actually split the data into this way. And for consistency, we also use the same sort of time trenches to split our data into. So some of the findings, first of all, in terms of the clustering, this actually explaining using, uh, explaining why we did the clustering and how that actually helps in understanding the variation uh, at the spatial, uh, spatial variation of the data. So you would see that these colors uh, provide the clusters from the cluster one to cluster five, latent cluster one to five, and then the numbers in here are the population density. And on the X axis, you have the area types. So these are two of five or six indicators that we use for clustering. But actually highlighting why it is helpful. So for instance, if you look at the inner London, you would see that the bits that has a minimum a sort of like an average uh, population density of 94 is allocated with the rest of central London to the cluster one. But the bits which are like have a population density of 36 is uh, allocated to cluster two with the outer London and part of metropolitan areas. Uh, and the 21 is actually the part of the cluster three within the inner London, which is more similar to the metropolitan areas or other collaboration with the similar area type. So it's actually trying to grab the communality between these different indicators. And this is basically how the spatial distribution of these clusters can be seen. And because it's probabilistic, we manage not only to actually get the five clusters, but also in between transition areas. So if there is 70% of the chance of being in the metropolitan core dwellers as our cluster one, uh, we call it cluster one. If it is 50-50 chance between cluster two and four, then we call this new cluster three, which we call it transition area from two to four. And you would see the, the, the clusters map uh, a spatial distribution here. This is actually compared with when you use only area type, you would see that that can be much more detailed than this. Also, we compare the clusters with the measures of the travel patterns, such as percentage of the public transport use. And you see that how those change across the five latent clusters, uh, percentage of the private mode, etc. If you do the same by area type, you would see that there would be some sort of not as clean sort of distinguish here than you can get from the smaller number of clusters. However, I mean, you need to consider that the percentage of public transport, for instance, was not used as one of the indicators of the clusters, but is not, when we compare it against them, because we use the land use data and also accessible public transport as indicators, you would see that, that the clusters can be a good fit for travel patterns as well, such as average travel distance as well, you can see here, and the compared to area types is better distinguished. Um, when we compare the clusters uh, with uh, all the number of cases across the UK, you would then, across England, sorry, you would then see pretty much similarities in here as well. Um, as we expected, uh, that the cases are concentrated in the most urban and dense urbanized areas uh, with the better public transport accessibilities, etc. 
but it's not just that. So the spatial clusters are also highly correlated with other indicators that we have put in the model. And that's actually one of the questions that we had always in mind that by doing that, we need to be able to separate out the impacts from the living close to each other and accessing the public transport from like a type of job that the people might do. So you would see here that it is the variation of the clusters by Asian, Asian, British, non-motorized, uh, public transport, et cetera, for each of them. But you would see like the public transport, the clusters has a, as, as expected, defined sort of variation. Asian, Asian, British tend to live in the most dense urbanized areas mainly, but also lots of medium urban areas. Um, but the non-motorized groups are not that much distinct in that way. Um, and you would see that like the, for the, for the uh, different uh, sort of industry of risk that we have evaluated here, textile meals and uh, care home and warehousing are distinguished by the sort of distinguishable by the clusters however meat and fish process are more concentrated in the medium urban areas sort of like a smaller urban areas type things not always in the most dense urbanized areas so that's actually a variation here to consider as well so after doing that we did the multivariate regression analysis for each of these clusters so these are actually on the y-axis is our clusters and these are the standardized coefficients across all of them for a last time tranche that uh, we used. We also did that for all the different time tranches. And it's interesting that you would see that the most important sort of after standardizing the coefficient, the variable that comes up are the at-risk industries, such as care homes and warehousing couple. And you see here uh, that they have the most distinct risk and it is not just in one area type or the other it is across all different area types so that's actually reflects the fact that after controlling for the type of clusters and travel patterns etc we can still see that when you have the care homes and warehousing in the other areas those are reflected as a highly at risk so actually going back to the index of multiple deprivation type questions uh, we would also see the same for uh, the, 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 these uh, these red ones, which are the sorry, the uh, I meant the other like a ready meal textile, dark blue, that is also very very much sort of this uh, sort of identified as a high risk industry, but across all the travel clusters. Uh, yeah, so and this is also this is also showing uh, the stability over time so the way that we produce that is that it's called the k-fold analysis so we use the tenfold analysis you split your data uh, for within each clusters into 10 uh, day 10 chunk of data and then we uh, fit the model for nine of them and then test it on the the, the one which is left and through doing it repeatedly, we managed to find out what the sort of variabilities of our estimation is going to be. And you would see here, and actually we removed the effect of the time here. So we didn't do it by time tranche across time, all the times. But you would see here that high risk industries, uh, such as care home and warehousing, was not only significant and highly significant, but across all time periods. So what it means is that Yes, MPOs had an impact of reducing the significance to some extent and reducing the risk overall. However, it didn't target a specific sort of industry or specific groups of at risk. Um, so you see that also for the meat and fish processing, uh, which is these groups of the people. And then also the public transport, if I can find it. Um, yeah, the, the light green you see here, there, there, there. So also those. Or come up as positive and always positive basically and um, this is actually goodness of fit of the model so we had different models for each time tranche and for each travel cluster and you would see that, that this is actually the simple r square across all of them the model behave tend to behave better in the least dense more rural area and when you have a more dense urbanized area as you've seen from the residual from the random forest in previous uh, lecture as well this was actually less good when you are in most dense urbanized areas however it captured london and central london pretty you know reasonable uh, the main findings is that area with larger proportion of residents working in care homes and warehouses 
and to a lesser extent, ready meals and textile sectors are prone to higher risk of infection across all travel clusters and all time periods. The critical rule of geography variation in influences of COVID-19 is important. We have a bigger proportion of small families and fewer density of children are prone to lower risk of infection in medium and small urban area and rural area. So it's actually the, the variations we see. So, so it's as family size, however, is not significant risk factor in central and near London. If we find out the same thing for the working from home. So working from home is significant uh, in reducing the risk. The areas which tend to be like, uh, easier to work from home was significant to reduce the risk. Uh, however, um, not when they are in London because perhaps they would be involved in other type of activities. So these are, these are things to be considered. And the public transport has been identified as one of the main risk factors in all different area types. Actually, that's all I had to show. And uh, apologies, I tried to run through it fast to leave enough time for a bit of questioning and answering, but apologies if it was too fast, but I'm happy to respond to any, any, any questions that the audience might have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kaveh. Um, so if you stop sharing your screen, then I can look. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions, either clarifications or, or questions to pick up on the points that you've made? I guess it may be while you're thinking. I, I um, was curious, and it's possible that I just missed something, but if you were looking at cases from the test and trace data, um, I was curious how you might have accounted for different testing regimes associated with different lines of work. So if there was regular testing amongst care home workers, for instance, how might that, and, and you know, people in other industries may have been testing less, how, how might that have affected your analysis? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah. we use the one which is called the tier two um, by uh, the, the developer PhD and the UKHSA, which bring you together these different testing regimes um, and, 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 and trying to make the sense of it. But however, as I, as I mentioned a bit, uh, this actually, there, is bi there would be biases in this because of the reasons that you just mentioned. Uh, however, this bias would be bigger when you look at it at the individual level than when you are considering the spatial distribution of it. So for instance, another bias that you might think about is the uh, asymptotic versus the synthetic cases. So it's, uh, asymptotics don't get to the testing regimes. However, uh, you might make an assumption that where the synthetic data are more, you have a bigger asymptotic data as well. So when you're looking to the spatial distribution, you might have a better chance of capturing or like removing some of these biases, if you like, than when you are looking at the individual level. And that was one of the purposes of trying to do it in this way. No, oh, thank you. Have you have you done any comparison? Obviously, you're doing quite slightly different things, but any comparison to like some of the ONS community infection survey analyses? Yes, of yes. that's actually a very good point because that's actually part of the things that uh, we did. The comparison was interesting. So you cannot get as deep as, so when you look at it at the sort of community level like this, things such as vaccination for both of us comes as negative impact. But we didn't look at only the, the second dose or first dose, we look at the rate of change from the first dose to the second dose vaccination. And that was actually to cancel out some of the biases as well, because when you look at the differences, that actually reduced the impact. But things such as a, a, a workplace risk, actually, uh, that, that's the bit which is uh, at the individual level, you might have more trouble to capture it because the CIS data analysis haven't done much of like a segmentation in the way that we did for the cluster of the travel patterns or the cluster of land use. And the reason is that the data become too small to make sense if you segment it too much. That's actually the leverage that you have in this, the, in this aspect. But when you look at it across the whole thing, uh, then they would see that, yes, there is a significant risk of the industries, but they don't exactly capture the same industries as we do. However, we did the, because we use the IDBR data and we use the exact codes for catching the warehousing, etc., and they don't have those details. However, based on the industries that they had, which was most similar to ours, the comparison was making sense. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was lots of similarities, but they couldn't both segment by the time period and the travel clusters because the data become too small to make sense. 
So that's yeah. that's the problem, you know, when, when when you're going into those details and part of sort of, I would see it more as like a complementary rather than the comparative type analysis because when you focus on this and we say that look there is apparently the consistent risk with the these type of industries then in the test and trade is sort of then the covid infection survey data you can focus on those questions and extract the right data that you want to to look at that angle and then see why it is uh, so it's more like a, the, the aim was like trying to do this at this level and then they direct the policy questions the issue though is there is no test and trace data which is reliable anymore because of the all, all, all the issues so i mean the future of this is not very much certain hsc taking it forward for the other industries for their own work but that early warning system and what we had in mind is not possible now because of the lack of information uh, i don't think we have even the wastewater uh, information so it's a it's a it's a bit of like a dilemma here that how we can maintain this yeah or i guess understand what aspects or tools that you would want to extract to have in place and ready to move stand up quickly yeah um, <laughs> i sorry I'm, um does anyone else have any questions for cave right now um I guess there's anything else in the chat, is there, Liz? Uh, no, I think right now. I saw Julia, thank you um, for posting the link on the um, latent cluster analysis for the travel patterns. I think is that that preprint? Yeah, that's um, the one. Yeah, that's great. Thank um, well, thank you very much, Kavi. I think that was that was interesting, and as you say, um, complementary to other kinds of um, analyses that are that are around. So it'll be worth looking into further. Um, we're going to have a lunch break at twelve. Uh, pretty much from now, unless Jane, you or anyone else has has anything to say before we go to lunch. Um, no, I don't think so.